Let me welcome all of us in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ to the 10th study of the book of Hosea. Let us pray. Our Father and our God, in the name of Jesus Christ, we love the door of mercy of sound teaching, of sound learning, of inspired utterances and effective ripples, even to eternity. And so, Lord, may I speak in the name of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Amen. Welcome. This is chapter six, essentially, of the book of Hosea, but it starts with the last verse of chapter five, and I will read. And that was God talking in chapter five, last verse. I will return again to my place. On the day I acknowledge their guilt and seek my face, and in their distress they seek me, saying, I will now call to chapter six, or the call to repentance. Come, let us return to the Lord, for he has turned that he may heal us. He has stricken, and he will bind us. After two days, he will revive us. On the third day, he will raise us up that we may live before him. Let us know. Let us press on to, on to know the Lord. He is going for this show at the dawn. He will come to us as the showers, as the spring rains that water the earth. And this is uh, impenitence. And God started talking. What shall I do with you, Ephraim? What shall I do with you, Judah? Your love is, a, is like a morning cloud, like the dew that goes early away. Therefore, I've hewn them by the prophets, I've slain them by the words of my mouth, and my judgment goes forth as light. For I desire steadfast love and not sacrifice, the knowledge of God rather than burnt offerings. But at Adam, they transgressed the covenant. There they dealt faithlessly with me. He is a city of evil doers. So the priests are banded together. They murder on the way to Shechem. Yea, they commit villainy. That's wickedness. In the house of Israel, I've seen a horrible thing. Ephraim's allotry is there. Israel is defiled. For you also, Judah, I have disappointed. When I will restore the fortunes of my people and attract to chapter 7, this is what word of the Lord, thanks be to God. That's the definition. This is divine ag agony on faithlessness in the pictorial. You can see Goma, husband and wife. Ozia means salvation. The wife is another thing. She was recruited from the harlot, and that is Israel. That's the nation you are seeing, feeling guilty beside the man representing salvation. And that was the way they weathered the storm of 40 years marriage, 40 years of ministry, to show in the ordinary how God's agony on faithlessness can be. That's the map of the entire nation representing Goma, key to a person. Divine, we're talking about nature of God. It's agonizing because it has physical and mental suffering. If you're talking about faithlessness, talk about disloyalty. Talk about not being able to be trusted. Talk about falsehood and being a traitor. That's about definition. You see, God is all-knowing with ability to see the spoken and unspoken intentions, actions and reactions of man. God is also able to know what the reaction of every man would be. So this study is a publication of the agonizing analysis of God about the Jews living in Israel and Judah that's down south in the 40 years agonizing prophetic ministry of Hosea. Let us go. You see, God is used to pattern of prayers. When men seek forgiveness, we are seeking for benefits. Chapter 6 verse, who raise their hand to the sky. He has torn, but he will heal us. He has injured, but he will bind us. He will bind up our wounds. That's the way they talk. And to put it in the words of Isaiah, chapter 64, they will not say, but you, Lord, you are the Father, we are the clay. 
you are the potter and we are the work of your hands. We know how to eulogize of God. He's used to a pattern. You see, you can see this conglomerate of arrows. When God was talking to Solomon, he gave, he gave a typical pottery of the type of request they made to him. He came to Solomon and said, you have not asked for riches, wealth. They are, there's a difference between riches and wealth. God was saying, you have not, what did you already ask me? Riches, wealth, or honor? No, the life of your enemies, let my enemy die. You are not even asked for long life. Those are five things human beings come to God for. God is up there. You can see that bowl. He said, I will return to my place. So the question is, why does God feel so distant? You know, know these are shopping lists. And you see people running on the floor, asking for riches, asking for health, asking for position, asking for their enemy to die, asking for long life. So when we're talking about the agony of God, it's used to the pattern of the request of men. So we're not talking in this bowl on your left, that's the earth, he is fine. That's the distant God. And on my right is the sinner's crocodile tears. You can see this crocodile is eating and that's the tear. You can see the tear drops from his right eye. The crocodiles do shed tears over their prey. They seem to cry, not because they are sincerely sad, but due to the biological mechanisms why they were in their play. We are seen personified in our flesh. We shed crocodile tears. Let me give you an example. What's the difference between guilt, remorse, regret, and repentance? Before I say that one, let's use Judas as an example, crocodile tears. Judas was more sorrowful for himself than he was for his participation in Jesus' betrayal. It had, he had been caught, it had been published. The Daddy Shekels was a an household you know, discussion. He was sorry for himself. This wasn't a demonstration of repentance, which leads to salvation, but of sorrow, guilt, and deep-seated remorse. Those are the things, to say it in the pidgin English, those are the things doing Judas. And they only lead to ultimate death. This is what the Apostle Paul has said in 2 Corinthians 7, 10, about the sorrow, man, you know, worldly sorrow leads to death. So let's now distinguish between, let's see the differences between guilt, remorse, regret, repentance. Guilt is a prison that will keep you perpetually bound, but leave you unchanged. You may, not, you may even be crossing the road. You don't even know if anything is coming. That's guilt. Remorse enslaves you in a sorrow that engulfs you emotionally without crying and leaves you feeling sad, depressed, hopeless, but unchanged. Regret is self-pity, which is focused more on your own personal loss than on the pain or loss you cause the others or to the heart of God, regret will leave you unchanged. Repentance is a quality decision. That's, it has decision making. Repentance is a quality decision to change. And when genuine repentance occurs in a person's heart and mind, you can be sure God will respect it. The only Spirit will release his power to effect, assist you effect that change in that person's life and lead into freedom. Repentance will lead to freedom Guilt, remorse, regret will leave you unchanged. God is used to the pattern of our prayers. See what God said in verse 7 of our study tonight. But at Adam, they transgressed the covenant. The assignment God made them, he called it covenant. But at Adam, they transgressed the covenant. There they dealt faithlessly with me. You can see the angel sending them out of the garden of Eden. God called it transgression. God called it faithlessness. God is, you know, God's word is born is covenant. And we are told the sorrow that is according to the will of God produces his repentance without regrets, leading to salvation, but not for Adam, not for Mr. Adam. But the sorrow of the world produces death. 
Let me tell you what Adam did. See this master smart, Adam? Genuine repentance are not what only we're talking about. Godly grief produces a repentance that leads to salvation without regrets. Whereas worldly grief produces death. See Mr. Adam. And he said, yeah, people who feel remorse make excuses. Mr. Adam said, the woman whom thou gavest to be with me. In other words, see that woman. Remorse will give excuses, while those who repent take responsibility. Adam did not take responsibility. So when God is agonizing, because of the pattern of our confession, it's nice to analytically know what the matter is. This repentance again. Genuine repentance are not words only. So they were in their words of being sorry in verses in chapter six, verse two and three. After two days, they are even wondering, they are calling the days. After two days, God will revive us. On the third day, He will raise us up that we may live before Him. Let us know, let us press on to know the Lord. He is going for the show as a dawn. Amen, amen. He will come to us and the showers and the springing of water. We, 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 we have those words. But the Bible says in Joel, rend your hearts and not your garments. And turn, that's talking about repentance, and turn to the Lord your God for his gracious and merciful and slow to anger. God responds to repentance, not remorse, not, not guilt. Repentance is more than regrets. Repentance is more than remorse. It's not merely being sorry for your sins. It is being sorry enough to quit. Repentance is a change of mind that results in a change of behavior and not a said. This is the way God has described man's love. Man's pattern of love is conditional, unstable, short-lived, and heartbreaking. And in verse 6, God was saying, What shall I do with you, O Ephraim? What shall I do with you, O Judah? North and south, there are no different distances and have a dozen. Your love is like a morning cloud, like the dew that goes away. In the morning, you see dew gathering. When the sun shines, it will evaporate. That's the way the love of man is. And as somebody has put it in a simplistic way, like a question, why do you love like the, like the dew that goes early away? That's God. In the cloud, you see those drops floating. In the morning, they vanish. That's the way man's love can be. And like I put it in this one, two, three, four pictures, man's pattern of love is conditional. It is short-lived. It's heartbreaking. Psalm 78 says, their heart was not steadfast towards him. They were not true to his covenant. In another translation, their heart was not right with him. Neither were they steadfast in his Covenant. You can see the hearts chained down like that short put heavy metal. That's conditional love. The heart is not allowed to do like God's heart will be. It's weighed down by Mr. Selfishness in a black ball or red ball. I can see that selfish man. Imagine they are all standing on the 30 meter heights in the circles. You can see that Mr. Selfish, when he now gets up, he kicks others headlong down. That's the political planet. Mr. Selfish who appear to, they will even say they are born again, they have joined another party. It is, uh, they will say all sorts of things. When they get there, they will, he will kick others off one by one. He will block your telephone. You are home and dry. You only wait for the next election. That's the pattern of man's love. It's conditional, it's short-lived, it's heartbreaking. You see, unfortunately, I would say unfortunately, because we are, you are just joining us, we are talking about divine agony on faithlessness. Such conditional love of man really evokes divine judgment. In theory, we are talking about divine agony. And see what God has said in verse 6, which is terrible. Therefore, I have hewn them that have cut them down. That's what he said to Nebuchadnezzar. 
Therefore, I've hewn them by the prophets, I've slain them by the words of my mouth, and my judgment goes forth as light. You know, God spoke the world into being. He used his words to create. Once his words go to the judgment, it's terrible. I've slain them. See what Jesus Christ said to the seven churches in Asia Minor. In the book of Revelation, chapters 2 and 3, shall I say, yes. I said, yesterday, seven churches, they were swallowed in today's talking. They are now Islamic, 95% Islam. See what Jesus Christ said by his words. I will come to you and remove your lampstand. Revelation 2.5. That's the church of Ephesus. In Laodicea, he said, I will vomit you out of my mouth. That's Revelation 3.16. So you talk of Pagamon in Revelation 2.16, I will war against them with the sword of my mouth. So the judge of Sardis, Revelation 3.3, I will remove, I will come like a thief, and you will not know at what hour I will come against you. And the judge of Tatera, I will strike our children dead. It's happened to those seven churches. The only two other churches who were not, who, who, who were not chastised, they were Philadelphia and Smyrna. So God forbid that is in anger, he will speak and it's words like sword. So human commitment, only humans, such human commitment only evokes God's judgment. Like in Psalm 95, which Anglicans talk, say it's not even Therefore I swore in my anger that it should not enter my rest. And if you remember Isaiah 55, 11, my word would not return to me for it. Without accomplishing what so when God said he will not enter his rest, he was not even just talking about promised land. It was a terrible, it's a terrible thing for God to speak in anger. It's as good as reversal of blessing. So from the beginning, because Jeremiah's ministry and Hosea's ministry, they were around the same time. He told Jeremiah, I've made this day a defense city and an iron pillar. And I'm praising wars against the whole land, against the kings of Judah, against the princes thereof, against the priests thereof, against the people of the land. They were able, not able to kill Jeremiah. He said, today I appoint you over nations and kingdoms to approach and to tear down, to destroy and to overflow, to build and to plant. That was Jeremiah and the whole nation of Israel. He said, I've made, because they have spoken this word, I'm making my words in your mouth, as fire, you can see fire coming. So when people are saying fire, fire, the fire can consume if it's spoken in anger, in divine anger. I'm making my words in your mouth a fire. And these people, wood, and the fire shall devour them. So divine anger is not what you will ever pray for when God is in his judgmental. Now, that was how Adam lost his earthly paradise forever. Our book of study, Hosea 6, 7 says, but at Adam, they transgressed the covenant. There they dealt faithlessly with me. That's the angel of light sending men out, out of the garden. At Adam, they transgressed. They dealt faithless with me. So who is this faithless person in the Bible? It is Satan, you know. Adam and Eve, chose to follow the faithless Satan rather than faithful God. Satan persuaded them to focus on what they could see rather than what God said. So Satan is still enticing people with our five senses. Oh, that figure eight is good. Why, why don't you have it as a, as, a, as a woman friend? It will entice you with what you can see more than what God has said. The strategy was so successful that Satan has successfully used it on humanity. Satan is the prime example of faithlessness. And he, he lured Adam and Eve until they were sent out of the garden. And their immortality was replaced with mortality. Coming back to Hosea chapter 6, in verse, chapter 6, verse 9, he said, The leopard will not change his skin. He said, As robbers lie in wait, as robbers lie in wait for a man. So the priests are banded together. They murder on the way to Shechem. Yea, they commit failure and wickedness. 
If you remember that when they got at Shechem, when Jacob was coming from Aran, that was when Levi and Simon deceived, when their sister was raped, they massacred the whole, the whole city of Shechem. And God is still saying, as robbers lie in wait for a man, so the priests are branded together. The mother on their way to Shechem, they committed greatness. And that was Jacob, you can see in his deathbed, he was saying Simeon and Levi are brothers. Their swords are weapons of violence. So they were scattered because they were so violent. Although they called them men of God. Now, God, I wouldn't say whether he pity or not, they, 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 they had usurped God's elastic limit of anger. They, you know, they dealt faithlessly. In, verse, in chapter 5, which we dealt with last week, they have dealt faithlessly with the Lord, for they are born alien children. Now the new moon shall devour them with their filth. They were so idolatrous. You can see that golden cap. That golden cap has now given them adulterous children. But, you know, the, the child of adultery that David had with Bathsheba did not survive. So they have even brought forth adulterous children spiritually. And nothing can prevent judgment. So when we are getting to chapter 8, he's now saying, sound the trumpet to your lips. For if all is over the house, he's saying, prepare for, prepare for exit. Prepare for forceful ejection. Let us now compare the love of God. You know the song we see? The steadfast, of the, the steadfast love of the Lord is for, you know, the steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. New, the steadfast love of God is not like the morning dew. It's, it's refreshed. It's renewed. It's great. That's it. That's it. You know, in Malachi chapter 3, that God said, I, the Lord, do not change. His love, his, his compassion does not change. And that's what Psalm 78 says. But he, being full of compassion, forgave their iniquity and did not destroy them. You can count on the love of God. Can you see this man, Joshua, who had messed up during the time of the He had given his, grand, his grandson to marry people with Sambalan and Tobiah. And when the, when the rebels, your, your, your actual is they are like rats. And they said they saw Joshua standing before the angel, he tattered and rats. But the love of God will not, will not allow it. What they said. And I said, let them put it clean to on his head. So they put it clean to on his head and clothed him with garments. And the angel of the Lord was standing by. This is the way God is. His love does not reciprocate our wickedness. Can you see the type of love? Romans 5, 8. God proves his love towards us when we were yet sinners. Christ died for us. And when you are talking about the concluding verses of chapter 8 of Romans, he said, I'm sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything in all creation will be able to separate us from the love. You are tattered and fist and fist is smeared. God will still love you and say, He must not die. He just must not go. Reach after him. That's the type of God's love. You can see the whole. Earth is in his hand. In other, God loved the world so much that he gave his only begotten son. That through him we might be saved. That's God. That is God. And even on the cross, it is depicted as first as John 15, 13. Greater love as no man than this, that a man laid down his life for his friends. That is God. So God's type of love. It's not an exchange for bribery or sacrifice. Someone was telling Saul, as the Lord the great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices, as in obeying the voice of the Lord, behold, to obey is better than to sacrifice. Don't just say you give seven sermons and seven, seven, seven fasting and this. God, all God is looking for is obedience. So the obedience is the outward evidence of the true fear of God. Now we say, okay, I will sort it out when we get to. And when Samuel was confronting Saul, he followed that by saying, 
Rebellion is at the scene of witchcraft. We said that somebody is a witch. And God is saying rebellion, disobedience, is at the scene of witchcraft. And stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. Because you have rejected the word of the Lord, he has rejected you. So unfaithfulness makes God to go into a rage. He said, I desire steadfast love and not sacrifice. The knowledge of God rather than burnt offerings. You know, in Micah, we are told, he has shown you, O oh mortal, O oh man, what is good and what does the Lord require of you, to act justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with your God. So when we are talking about God's love, he expects a wonderful, spontaneous reciprocation. You can see these geese talking about knowledge of God. He said, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God. And everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. When we're talking about knowledge of God, we're not talking about the, you know, the theoretical God's type of glory. That like this, we may be sure that we know him. Knowledge of God has to do with deep encounter of him, that we know him. He will keep his commandments. And you can be sure that he will keep his commandments. If somebody says, I know God, but doesn't keep his commandments, he's a liar. So the knowledge of God. So now coming to a conclusion with the next five minutes before we start discussion, the level of faithlessness goes to abysmal ones with violence. God was accusing the priests. Gilead is where the headquarters was mispacked where they were sacrificing to God, where Samuel was there. Gilead is a city of evil doers, trapped with blood. As robbers lie in waste, so the priests are banded together, they murder on the way to Shechem. The priests don't take swords, they only crucify people with all sorts of taking advantage of them. So God was so Annoying. Talking about faithlessness, there is swearing, there is lying, there is killing, there is stealing, there is committing adultery. They break all bounds and murder follows murder. That's the way God saw the Israel. And he's not looking for hypocrisy of sanctuary workers. Jeremiah chapter 7, verse 10 and 9 and 10 say, Will you steal, murder, commit adultery, swear falsely, burn incense to Baal? and walk after other gods whom you do not know, prostitution of religion. And now come and stand before me in this house, which is called by my name, and say we are delivered to do all these things. So God, the level of faithlessness that Israel has shown, which we should today in our nations, is a mystery. Now some slander, his girl said the slander, and eat upon mountains, they commit lewdness, sexual immorality. And in chapter 6 of Genesis, this question is being asked when God regretted that he created man. Sin has troubled God. Has sin troubled you? So when we're talking about God's attic, he started soon after creation. And like this man says, sin is treason, not sinus trouble. God will God forgive sin, but he does not heal sin. So God wants us to listen to his voice and to repent. And God has, it's good for you to know this, this passage in your, in, your, in your diary, Jeremiah 18, 7 to 10, and I read. If at any time I declare concerning a nation or a kingdom that I will pluck up and break down and destroy it, and if that nation concerning which I have spoken turns from its evil, I will repent of the evil that I intended to do to it, and if at any time I declare concerning nation or kingdom that I will build and plant it, and it and if it does not, and if it does even in my sight, not listen to my voice, then I will repent of the good which I tell to do. God is saying, I don't joke with obedience. The, the tempered long can always change. This is judgment seat. You can see Jesus in white. He said, Friend, how did you come here without a wedding garment? And it was really bind him out and throw him away. By the wedding garment is a righteous deeds, evidence of repentance, evidence of true repentance. So since creation, men are without excuse. And the time to repent is now. About five minutes to 12. 
in creation. This day is time. Now is the acceptable time. All the all the signs of end time, they are coming, they are pouring down. The trumpet can sound any day. And divine agony on faithlessness is what Israel executed. What is yours? What is mine? And God said, my spirit, you are not abide with man forever. Faithfulness will be heaven at your doorstep. Jesus Christ said, John 14, 23, if a man loves me, he will keep my words and my father will love him. I will come to him and make a home with him. God, the father, God, is only, they will descend and be your guests. That's what divine faithfulness can give you. But faithlessness can be terrible. You know, what's the time you just had up to 500 followers. And when he was talking about eating his flesh, 500 deserted him. And he told the 12, will you go away? And he said, no. So the man going on faithlessness has an observation of the nature of God. If we deny him, he also will deny us. If we suffer with him, we shall reign with him. And the Bible says, if we are faithless, he will remain faithful because he cannot deny himself. So faithlessness can be terrible. But I, I must not end without letting us know the reality. When you are faithful to God, your faithfulness can cost you something. If you can be abused, you can be violently handled, you can be lost, you know, deserted, you can have, you know, the faithfulness to God will make you obey scriptures, but not without consequences, but not for long. So, and the warning is this, as in Revelation chapter 2 and chapter 3, I have this against you. You have abandoned your first love. See the mass, Japa. You have abandoned your first love. He has turned his back. And he said, all fast what you have so that no one sees your crown. There are five crowns in heaven. Crown of life, incorruptible crown, crown of righteousness, crown of glory, crown of rejoicing. We will never lose our crown in Jesus' name. When we are talking about divine agony and faithlessness, you can see this man. He has lost talk. I like this saying. He says, faithless is he that says farewell when the road darkens. For better, for stay, for worse, for run away. I will have given the story of St. Albans, a lot of notes St. Albans in Britain. He was a soldier who refused to he refused to give out the man who was hiding under him. The body were going to execute him. And he took that man's place to be executed. That's an album forever. So faithless is he that says farewell when the road darkens. Now the divine agony just was saying, oh, faithless and perverse generation, when his disciple could not heal demonic. So God wants us to have a sustainable faith in him. Our memory verse, for I desire steadfast law and not sacrifice the knowledge of God rather than burnt offerings. Let me define the knowledge of God. Our knowledge of God is derived from a personal encounter and experience with the triumph good, triumph God, who graciously draws the humble. It is not theoretical. It has to do with a relational issue with God. As another key into discussion, you know, we are talking about divine agony. That divine agony was not revealed to anybody. The type of people with whom God shared divine agony, they were people who lived righteous life unto God. See somewhere, he was also with the, he was always with the ark. And God was telling him, I'm about to do something in Israel, we the air will turn good. When you are talking about Paul, from his calling to the end, he's the man saying, for me to live is Christ, to die is gain. How much revelation did God, did Paul have? Plenty. He wrote more than half of the New Testament in the epistle. And he was saying in 1 Corinthians, who has understood the mind of the Lord, so as to instruct him, but we have the mind of Christ. So when God is Revealing is pain. He most oftentimes revealed to me people who are dedicated, like the 12 disciples 
who he appointed to be with him and to be sent out. They were with him. They wrote, they authored the Gospels, but there is no Gospel according to Judas, who was an unfaithful disciple. You and I, we, when you abide in me and he abides in us, Ozia, Jeremiah, people who wrote scriptures, they would have been abused, but they, they lived dedicated life to Christ. Ezra, Esther, Neymar. Now for our for our discussion, can we now talk about Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and the New Testament people? And the question is, who are the characters in scriptures that showcase genuine repentance? 